and I would like to present to you two, ma two founders of the Zermatt Summit because people have asked me last year, who is behind the Zermatt Summit? Is it a big <laughs> corporation? Is it a, a public organization? But in fact, it's uh, people like you and me. And uh, so I'm very honored here to have uh, Nicolas Michel, who is a uh, vice president of the Zermatt Summit Board and who is a uh, former Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and International Professor of Law, Nicolas Michel, and Nicolas Buté, who is a Catholic priest and is a founder of the Eucharistine com uh, community, a moderator of the Eucharistine uh, fraternity, and also founder of the Philanthropos uh, International Institute of Anthropology. He's also, so I will give the word now to my friends who will give you their definition of the common good, which will set the stage for the next, next two days. Thank you very much. I think I will speak in French, so if you need any translation, it will be good to get uh, uh, things now. Voilà. Donc, uh, oui. Now, I remember a story that always struck me. There was a gentleman who was uh, walking or riding across a village on horseback. People were looking at him, uh, saying to him, where are you going so f so quickly? That person was saying, I don't know, ask my horse. So I, I do believe that this is what's happening in the world today. We're running around, we're advancing. Progress has been the goal of our development for two centuries. We had absolute faith in progress and indeed extraordinary technical progress was made for the good of humanity. But there's also been failures and repeated crises, for instance, over the past two decades, have shown us that we've come into a dead end because we're now lacking a, a, a real goal, a sense of purpose. What are we aiming at? What are we progressing towards? Is this the kind of good that we're looking for? So I do believe that the summit will allow us to set ourselves new goals and ask ourselves, what are we aiming at? We're caught up in some rapid movement. We're caught into this ideology of progress. But, and of course, though it is legitimate, it's lost uh, touch with reality. So we do have to rethink our activity. We have to wonder why we want to develop. We have to wonder why we want to grow. Because growth is sometimes disconnected from reality. It's like a cancer that's gnawing at our society. So we need to rethink our priorities. And by way of introduction, we should establish a new hierarchy of values. I do believe that societies can only structured based on, be structured based on moral values. In each human being, there's a soul. There's more than just a quest for money and from the beginning of mankind, this is what has structured humanity. Now, after spiritual values, we have cultural values in society. They enshrine these major spiritual values in living together in uh, societies, in values that people can identify with. And then you have political values, and they're specificity is that they the structure the common good that the guardian of common good they coordinate the various various uh, uh, layers of society and then you have goods and services that are needed because of course we do need goods and services to develop and finally you have technical values serving various processes of development. So I do believe that one of our tragedies today has to do with the fact that spiritual values uh, were little by little excluded. Cultural values of lost ground, 
they've lost their main purpose, i.e. to humanize people. Political values have, have lost places well. Finances gained ground. And therefore, values have been totally turned upside down. So we, we do need to find a new logic in common good. And to do that, we'll have to find a new sense of purpose, a new, establish a new hierarchy of values so that we can collaborate, not um, just based on our needs, but for the good of uh, society. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Father Nicolas spoke French. I will speak Franklish. <laughs> Since the general topic of uh, these two days and a half uh, is the common good, we thought it might be useful to uh, uh, attempt at a, a definition of, of the common good and to at least clarify the notion and uh, explain in what sense, in our view, it should be used. Uh, there is no generally recognized definition, but there is a widely disseminated definition of the common good. So let me go very uh, slowly, slowly, and read this definition. There are actually two forms of that definition. So the common good, according to this widely disseminated definition, is the set of social conditions that allows human beings, families, and associations to find fulfillment more completely and more easily. So you see the elements, social conditions, then human beings, families, associations, and the objective for these to find fulfillment more completely and more easily. Put in very similar terms, another definition says that the common good is the set of social conditions that allows groups and their members to attain their perfection in a fuller and easier way. Out of this definition, three elements can be taken. The first one is the respect for the human person per se. The second one is the concern for social well-being and development of the community. And the third one is peace, and peace in a twofold sense, meaning that of security and sustainability. Now let me make a few comments about this. First, insisting on what the common good is not. There are a number of uh, expressions close to this that are in use and, and misleading. Let me just simply mention two. These days, the word common good is used to refer to well, common goods like the water, the air, extra atmospheric space, or intellectual goods like uh, language or uh, other things. No, it's, it's not that these elements are not relevant to some extent, of course. Who has ownership over these elements is an important element of what the common good is, but the common good is much broader than that. A second notion that cannot be uh, mixed with the one of common good is public interest. In fact, public interest is more a legal notion, the objective of which is to delineate, to set the limits between the public sector and the private sector. So in order for the state to act in a legal way, in a legitimate way, it has to base its action and intervention on a public interest, which is defined as the interest of the majority, the interest of, uh, of the great number. So where there is no public interest, there is no legitimacy for the state to intervene. And when it's about public interest, it's really the first responsibility of the public sector. So we are here in a different world. So what are the main characteristics of, of, of the common good? So let me start by saying first that the notion of the common good strikes the right balance between the individual, the human being as an individual on one hand, and the community on the other hand. In my next remarks, I will explain further this. So my second remark is about the origin of the notion. So the origin is of an anthropological nature. What does it mean? The origin rests 
on a vision of who the human person is, who the human being is. This human being is, on one hand, a unique individual, never in the history of the whole mankind, humankind, will there be somebody who is you, mm -hmm. you and you. So this unicity, uniqueness of the individual. But also, this human person is, by nature, a social person that needs relations in order to exist and to fulfill his or her needs. In this vision, the, the humanism that is behind this notion has three dimensions. First, the creative dimension, the creation, that's our work. But in the broad sense, also uh, cultural creation is part of this dimension. Second one is the community dimension, the social dimension, the fact that precisely we need relations with others to exist and fulfill our needs. And the third one being the spiritual dimension, as was said before. So one has to have this vision of this human being at the origin of the notion of the common good. Now, where lies the specificity by third remark when I said that the notion strikes the right, balan right balance between the two? So it is that the, the good of, of, the, of the community, of the whole, has to take into account the fulfillment of the needs of each individual and the individual in his or her totality. Tout homme. Man as a whole and each and every man, or human being. Uh, the, the will to focus particularly on the needs of those who are weaker in, in the society. So common good entails a particular attention to each individual, in particular to the weakest in the society. Now, with this vision, where do we stand in the whole landscape of uh, similar visions? Well, first, this is, of course, takes a clear distance with individualism, of course, where the individual is important but seen as uh, alone with the responsibility for him or herself, and that's it. So this vision leads to an exacerbated individualism. Or on the contrary, an exacerbated focus on the community may lead to totalitarianism or collectivism. So the, the vision of the common good is not meant to be a compromise. It is a genuine vision, but that, that has to be clearly distinguished from the two others. Now, my fourth comment is, who now is in charge of the common good? Speaking about public interest, I said it is the public sector, the state, the governments. Now, when it comes um, to the common good, each individual has a responsibility towards the common good as an individual, but also as a member of a family, as a member of a firm, of a corporation, as a member of social groups. And of course, this is not always sufficient. At some point, the, uh, the public sector has to, uh, to take over. So this is where the speci special responsibility of the state and all public collectivities comes into play. In fact, the common good is the source of the legitimacy of public power, of, of the state. It's the raison d'être, in fact, of, uh, of the state. But that does not mean that the state is in charge of the whole common good, on, on the contrary. So, uh, individuals, groups, firms, corporations, intermediate mm -hmm. bodies, as soon as there is some level of common interest, it's not immediately the state that has to step in, but intermediate bodies like uh, uh, associations of interested entrepreneurs or trade unions or cultural groups or solidarity groups, uh, uh, etc. Now, my last remark is that each community has its own common good. A family has its common good. A social group has its uh, common good. Now, of course, at the public level, it is the same. You have the public sector at the communal level, at the state level, sub-federal level, federal level, at the regional level, like, like Europe. And there is no reason to stop at that, obviously 
the world community as such has also its common good. So that's why it's perfectly legitimate and necessary to refer to the notion of the universal common good. That's where we will start this afternoon with the first panel. Now with that, I come to my conclusion. Of course, what I have been saying here might seem to be a little bit theoretical. It is absolutely not. Ideas matter. But of course, there is a need for a realistic approach. And there, the starting point has to be the reality of who the human being is. But there is a need for concretization. And that's what we are going to do this afternoon and the coming days, how we're going to simply share our experiences. We all feel the need to create a coherence between the thirst we have for the common good and the way we act in the practical world. And we already have this desire, but we want to share together experiences on how to be more coherent on a day-by-day -day basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>